Okay, here we are at our first Orange Owens Gorge stop. Again, you can see nice views of the Sierras um, down in the Round Valley there. And buttermilk country is what it's that sort of flat plain back there is called. And, and uh, the Tungsten Hills or the low hills there again. And the Owens, sorry, the Owens Valley down there and the Inyo Range on the horizon. And so if we walk a little bit this way from the parking area, we'll see there's a big canyon here. This is the gorge of the Owens River. Okay, well, still can't actually see all the way down to the river down there, um, but you can see where it probably should be. Uh, our next stop, you'll be able to actually see the river. Um, so this whole plateau here, again, is created up of the Bishop Tuff, uh, which is this pink rock here. Um, and so this rock is basically made of, we'll look at, it's like this more on our next stop, but this is made of, of basically ash erupted out of the uh, Long Valley Caldera, just, you know, like 10 kilometers that way. Um, and when that ash, so the ash erupted out and it formed a giant pyroclastic flow. Um, so this would have been, you know, a mixture of ash and, and gas that have been, um, had enough gas in it to, to, to flow like a fluid. You know, think of this as sort of a, a glowing cloud of ash and gas that would have flowed across the countryside at maybe 100 miles an hour or 200 miles an hour or something like that. These things move very quickly. Um, you can tell by the thickness of the deposit here that it would have been very substantial to say the least. Um, you know, it's, I don't know, a couple hundred meters thick here. Uh, and when it land, when that ash stopped moving, it was still hot enough to weld together um, into a single unit. The other thing I want to point out from here, I'll, I'll take a picture to, to look at it but up close, but when you look at the surface of the plateau, you'll see there's little hillocks everywhere. Um, and each one of those hillocks uh, marks the location of a fumarole um, that developed on the surface of this plateau. So again, when this ash uh, was deposited, it was hot enough to actually weld together. And so um, all that heat, and, and, it, and again, this was originally a mixture of ash and gas. A lot of those gases would have been escaping. It would have been very hot. There would have been these little plumes of, of, of steam and other gases rising up out of it um, and making fumaroles. Uh, this would have looked sort of like the, a bigger version of the Valley of 10,000 Smokes in Alaska, uh, where there was a relatively small, um, caldera forming eruption that formed a, a similar sort of ash flow sheet, only on a much, much smaller scale. And then that uh, had fumaroles coming out of it for a decade or something like that. Um, but there were, there were just a huge number of fumaroles coming out of the ash sheet, which earned it the valley of the Valley of 10,000 Smokes. I'll try and put in a picture of that. Uh, but that's, so each of those, every place where there's a fumarole, um, the gas is coming up through the tuff um, helped recrystallize it into a, a stronger, uh, slightly more resistant to erosion rock. And so every place where there's a fumarole is now left of the hill because it it's, was harder to erode over the last 760,000 years, um, whereas the surrounding stuff was a little bit less welded. And, um, you know, basically the, the difference in elevation is the, how much it's eroded in the last 760,000 years, or at least the difference in erosion. Okay. Okay, here we are now at the upper Owens Gorge stop. And there are a few things to see here, but uh, one of the main points uh, to observe at this stop is the change in welding from the top to the bottom of the flow. So this is a I probably should have looked up the thickness, but a relatively thick flow here, let's say a hundred meters thick. Um, and so on the top, uh, first of all, the, the weight pushing down is a lot less. And also the top is gonna to cool down against the atmosphere relatively quickly. And so the top is not as strongly welded. So here, um, you can see it, it's light in color. 
Uh, if we look at so that, one of the deficient stuff, so if we look at it, it's got, you know, it's mostly this fine ash. It's got volcanic rock fragments in it. Um, there's a little chunk of, of rhyolite in there. Uh, I think we poke around, we should find pieces of pumice. There are these little white things are pumice, um, which is a frothy rhyolite rock formed. So the pumice is actually formed basically as the magma is erupting. It sort of puffs up like popcorn. Um, in the case of the, the bishop ash, it puffed so violently that most of it sort of completely disaggregated into tiny, tiny fragments, which would be called ash, which is the fine-grained stuff in the matrix. But some of the larger popcorn pieces remain, and that's the pumice. Um, so there's pumice, there's these volcanic rock fragments, or, or what we call lithics. These are usually pieces of older volcanic rocks that were there before the volcano exploded. Um, and then the other thing we can find a lot of, as you won't be able to see with this thing, is... There are also crystals in here, crystals of quartz and sanidine mostly. Sanidine uh, is the high temperature version of potassium feldspar um, that cools down rapidly and it has this glassy look to it. It almost looks like quartz actually, um, except that because it's the feldspar mineral it has cleavage. So you probably can't see any of the crystals, but you will occasionally see a little flash maybe um, as one glints off. There might be some little tiny sparkles coming out of there. And those are those sanidine crystals for the most part. Um, because the sanity have the have that cleavage to them, they play in flat planes, which then reflects the, the light nicely. Um, and so usually the, the sanity will be more rectangular and shiny than the quartz, uh, whereas the quartz will usually be more sort of gray looking and have a conchoidal fracture to it. Or sort of like these curved shell-like fractures. Okay, um, so anyway, so up here, note, again, it's white. Um, it's also pretty soft. You know, if we take one of these pieces just in our hand, we can, we can break it apart. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's welded, but it's not strongly welded. Uh, presumably above this, there would have been unwelded tough, but that's mostly now sort of weathered away um, over the last 160,000 years. Since unwelded tough is very susceptible to erosion, since it's just loose ash, basically. Okay, so if we continue down the canyon, um, we should see that this top becomes more strongly welded. And we'll see what kind of... Also, just looking at, you can see there are these big holes in it. Um, those are called lithophysae. Um, actually, some of them might just be weathered up pumice chunks. But... Uh, sometimes you get these big gas bubbles in the top of a, towards the top of the welded part of the tuff. And where you have those, notice here they're relatively round bubbles, holes in them. As we get down lower, we'll see that things are, are become progressively flattened out uh, by the weight of the rock above them. So here, it's already starting to change a little bit, and it's starting to turn more of a pink color. Um, this pink color you often find in the Bishop Tuff is created by microscopic particles of the mineral hematite, um, which in small particles has a red color. Uh, hematite is just iron oxide, so it's sort of similar to rust in that sense, is why it gives you a red color. And and so that, that hematite, in turns out, and other minerals are, are created by hot gases in the in the tuff as it's welding. Um, so sometimes it's referred to as vapor phase alteration because it's um, crystals grown um, directly out of out of gases or, or vapor. Uh, another thing you'll see as we, as we start to go down the these these big class of pumice and things like this are still relatively round. Um, they're maybe starting to get a little bit flatter on average than they were at the last time. You can see now there's two more of these that are a little bit more starting to climb out in the horizontal direction. But still not that different here than what we just saw there at the top. Enter at your own risk. All the property around here is owned by the city of Los Angeles, who uh, has all the water rights to, well, almost all the water rights to the Owens Valley. Um, and so they take the water.
Okay, so here we come up back to the gorge. You can hear the Owens River down there in the bottom. Uh, so a couple things you'll see here. First of all, you can see the, the, the great thickness of the tuff here. Um, and the lower part, it's, it's sort of has a more massive structure, but up in the top, uh, you can start to see the, the, the sort of uh, columnar structures. I think there's a better one over there, so maybe I'll keep walking, but um, these, these, these uh, columnar joints, as they're called, um, you can see the sort of radially fanning out over there are related again to the cooling of the tuft. And so as the tuft cools, it shrinks and contracts. Um, and typically the joints will form perpendicular to the uh, to surfaces of, of constant temperature. Or to put it differently, they tend, to, they tend to go in the direction of heat flow. And so this thing would have been cooling off towards the top um, and so they tend to, uh, basically show you the paths that heat was flowing in back when it was cooling down. Now, you notice that they're not all going straight up. A lot of these have these sort of curved paths, um, where they, they branch out from some places and then they group in towards other places. And that, it has to do with these fumaroles, um, that, that I mentioned earlier. Uh, so again, you can see some little hillocks over here, and those hillocks would have been where the fumaroles were, and the vapor phase alteration. Um, or to put it again, they're just minerals growing um, out of hot gases, uh, then created these more resistant mounds in the tuff. Um, but in, when you look at, at the patterns of the jointing, you can see some, some joints like right there, the joints converge in from both sides, and that's indicating that that's a place where there's steam escaping, um, and that steam was carrying a lot of heat with it, so it cooled down closer to where the steam is escaping. So there probably would have been a fumarole up above that, that point where those, uh, where all of those, um, columnar joints converge. So as you look ahead, you can see that as we go down further down in the canyon, the tuff generally becomes a slightly darker color. Um, you know, basically, there's, well, there's a couple reasons for that, but um, basically there's, there's, there's less air. It's more thoroughly compacted. Um, so, you know, most of this tuff here is, is basically the, made of these tiny ash particles, which are just tiny pieces of glass, basically. Um, and so if you have, you know, pure volcanic glass is obsidian, and that's black, basically, because there's, there's no little bubbles of gas in there to refract any light. Um, whereas in this, in this tuff that's not welded quite as strongly, uh, there's, there's a bunch of air and little pore spaces, and that air refracts the light and makes it look lighter colored. So as it gets more welded, there's less air to refract the light, and it becomes darker in color. Uh, that's sort of an oversimplification, but uh, that's the more or less correct answer. Uh, so already now we can see that we get here, there, the, the pumice glass here is starting to be a lot flatter. See all these things here, they're no longer recognizable as pumice. You can't even see holes in them because basically the gases have all been squeezed out of the holes and these, these pumice clasts have been flattened a bit. Um, and when they're flattened, the pumice clasts, they're also known as fiamme, F-I-A-M-M-E, which I, I believe is Italian for flames because they look, well, if you imagine them rotated vertically, they look sort of like little flames. They have sort of a huge little bit of a wave to them. So you can see here that the rocks are again getting still darker. Um, now the pumices almost look black, uh, like obsidian, um, because they've been basically all the air has been squished, squeezed out of them. Um, you can also start to see all of the crystals in this a little bit more clearly. 
perhaps now that it's more compressed because the, the ash compresses down but the crystals stay the same size so the relative proportion of the volume proportion of crystals looks bigger the mass proportion is actually the same but there's a big flattened pumice that's now looks all glassy like a like a obsidian So another better views maybe of the columnar jointing over here. You see that the tuff is getting even darker gray as we get further down into the canyon. You can see the the Fiamme flattened even more. Well, I think this is probably about as far as we need to go. Basically, it doesn't get any darker from here on. It basically stays about the same uh, as you keep going deeper. Uh, but basically, at this point, the rock is a dark gray. It's slightly pinkish again from, from hematite in it. And uh, the Fiamme are, are very squished. Welcome to Long Valley Caldera. So this entire valley here is Long Valley. Um, and by caldera, we just mean the block of land that sank during that cataclysmic eruption 765,000 years ago. Um, and so the, the, just to cue you in on, on where the boundaries of caldera is. So that mountain range over there is Glass Mountain. And along the front of that is a it's a normal fault that's dropped down this valley. I say normal fault, but really a caldera sort of has a, uh, they're called ring faults because they actually go around in a circle or in this case, more of an ellipse. Um, and then the whole block in the middle drops down and the outside pops up. And so that, that ring fault comes along the front of the, the glass mountain there. And then if you go off this way, you can see there's, um, so the mountains, the snowy mountains of the distance are on the far rim of the caldera. And then there's sort of some low hills in the middle. Those are actually inside the caldera. So that's what's called the resurgent dome, which is where new lava came out and made some new volcanoes inside of the caldera after the giant 765,000 year um, eruption. Uh, so the, 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 the far wall of the caldera actually, so we're, we're in the, standing in the southeast corner now, so we're looking towards the northwest. The northwest wall is just a little bit in front of the high mountains there. Um, and then uh, wrapping around on the side of the mountains of the Sierras here is then the, the south uh, the south wall of the caldera basically follows the front of the Sierra Nevada mountains here. Um, so this whole valley is something like, I don't know, 15 by 25 kilometers in dimensions. Um, and basically that whole valley dropped in a week um, when the bishop top was erupted. And it would have been deeper originally because again, some of this has filled in with lake sediments. Um, this Lake Crowley is actually a, a man-made reservoir, but there, you know, there may have been a small natural lake here before the, the reservoir was enlarged. Um, and so let's see, a couple other things to point out here. So uh, the, the glass mountain there is, is mostly made of, of older uh, rhyolites that were erupted in the preceding one or two million years before the giant eruption that created the valley. Um, unrelated to the eruption, uh, in, in the Sierra Nevada mountains here, you can see a few things. One, you can see some nice um, metamorphic rocks here. So all of the, all of the sort of brown uh, and, and streaky rocks here are all uh, metamorphic rocks, or what we call roof pendants. And so they're basically the, the older metamorphic rocks that were the, well, metasedimentary and metavolcanic rocks 
that were there before the Sierra Nevada batholith intruded. So um, most of these metamorphic rocks here started out as, as sediments or sometimes volcanic rocks in the in the Paleozoic um, up into the earlier Mesozoic. Um, and then most of the gray rocks are then uh, plutonic rocks, granites, granodiorites, tonalites, diorites, things like that, that have intruded into um, those metamorphic rocks and metamorphosed them. In many places, then those metamorphic rocks have a near vertical orientation. Here you can sort of see they're, they're arranged sort of perpendic, uh, you know, dipping steeply perpendicular to us, sort of a, vertically along the crest of the range. And very commonly it seems that those, those blobs of metamorphic rocks seem to have been dropping down between the, the plutonic rocks. And the other thing we can see here, which is unrelated to either of those topics, is the low hills along the front of the range here are actually a glacial moraine. Uh, I believe this is McGee Canyon. Um, and so back in the last ice, last ice age, about 10,000 years ago, there was a big glacier that came down this canyon um, and it pushed out all the loose debris and boulders and rocks um, out into this big sort of lobate deposit, uh, which is which is just the, we'd call the terminal moraine of that glacier. So it's where all the rocks pushed by that glacier ended up in a big pile. And you can see those little dots on it are, are rocks, uh, but you know, those are really like house sized rocks. It's not very close to here. Okay, I think that's about it for this location, just an overview.